Okay. Remember, we will have lots of networking time later in the day to follow up with our speakers on questions and, and other comments. Uh, we do want to keep moving on so that we can get everybody in uh, close to on time. Um, and so I am very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Al Teich. Uh, Al is a research professor of science, technology, and international affairs at the Center for International Science and Technology Policy in the Elliott School of George Washington University in Washington, D.C., a position that he has held since February of 2012. Prior to joining the GW faculty, he was Director of Science and Policy Programs at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, where he was responsible for the association's activities in science and technology policy, where he managed a staff of 40 people and served as a key spokesman on science policy issues. Other areas where, uh, in which he is interested include, but are not limited to, globalization and its impacts on science and technology, budgeting and priority setting in research, uh, the politics of administration, and international big science institutions. Al holds a BS in physics and a PhD in political science. Welcome, Al Tyke. Thank you very much for being with us here today. learn something from listening to Bill Bonvillian. I learn a lot. I, it reminds me, though, my, my own education was at MIT, where he teaches. And we used to talk about getting an education at MIT as, as a bit like drinking from a fire hose. And I think uh, Bill's, uh, Bill's talk really had a tremendous amount of material in it. And, if you absorbed all of that, you can get a degree in science policy, you know, tomorrow. <laughs> but um, looking around the room here and, uh, and at the uh, science policy scene today, I'm impressed and inspired, really, by how this field, uh, which has been my field for essentially my whole professional career, has really grown and uh, uh, become much more important. Your grandmother may still not have any idea what you're doing or studying if you're in this field, um, but uh, it's a, trust me, it's a much bigger field, much wider field, more generally recognized field uh, than it was um, when I started out. To help you understand my perspective, and I think it's, I'm, I was in a position, can you hear me? Yes? Raise your hand if you can't hear me. <laughs> um, to help you understand uh, my perspective, I need to give you a bit of autobiographical information because I think I'm in a, I was in a position that many of you um, are today, at least from the few people that I have talked to in this, uh, in this uh, uh, audience here. Um, I was an undergraduate physics major at MIT in the 1960s. Uh, I got into physics sort of uh, accidentally. Um, I went to high school, in public high school in uh, Chicago, and I was sort of a science geek at the time, uh, and still am, really. Uh, in my freshman year in high school, I did a science fair project, and I built a, a Van de Graaff generator. Uh, that was not me. Um, uh, you can imagine that, you know, the Van de Graaff generator makes your hair stand up. You can hold a fluorescent bulb in your hand without uh, touching, uh, and it lights up, you know, and you're not getting a shock, but it's a, it's a very dramatic demonstration. Anyway, uh, so I got a lot of attention, and the school paper sent a reporter to interview me and do a story, and in the course of the interview, the uh, reporter asked what I wanted to do with my life. And I said, well, I think I want to go to MIT and become a physicist. 
Now, I really didn't know much about MIT. I'd never been there. Uh, I had no idea what a physicist did, really. Uh, but I thought it seemed like the right thing to say, and that kind of settled it for me. I never thought much about it after that. Uh, and when it came time to apply to colleges, I applied to MIT. Uh, I was admitted, and after surviving freshman physics, I chose the field as my major. Um, that should be that uh, dome looks familiar, actually. Here, yeah. um, that worked pretty well for a couple of years until I ran into thermodynamics and quantum theory and such things, and it was at that point that I decided maybe this isn't exactly what I do the rest of my life. Um, I mean, I really like phys science, but I wasn't sure that I really wanted to spend the rest of my life in the, in the lab, and I've heard that from a couple of people that I spoke to here. Uh, as it happened, the physics department had a, a colloquium on Friday afternoons, and uh, around one Friday around that time, uh, they had a speaker who had just returned to MIT from a couple of years in the, uh, in the White House, uh, where he'd been in the science advisor's office. Uh, now, I didn't know that the president had a science advisor and um, didn't, wasn't really sure what it did, but it sounded very interesting. And I said, wow, that's just the kind of thing that I'd like to do. Uh, to make a long story short, it turned out I didn't even have to move to go to graduate school. MIT was in the process of creating a political science department and uh, I ended up getting my PhD there. I finished my, uh, my uh, physics degree, my bachelor's degree in physics, and then I went on to, uh, to do the PhD in poli sci, and it was an excellent start to what has been and what continues to be uh, an interesting and rewarding career. And one of the things that I learned early on corresponds to what uh, Michaela asked me to talk about here, which is that uh, science policy isn't, in t when you talk about science policy, you're really talking about two fields. Uh, it's got uh, two faces, this, this field. There's policy for science, and there's science for policy. I mean, that's an old uh, kind of uh, distinction. It's uh, pretty obvious. Uh, but it makes sense and it's important, and sometimes important thing, uh, obvious things can be very important. Poli policy for science is what uh, most people think of as science policy. It has to do with uh, science itself and what needs to be done to manage it, to make it productive, and to see that it serves society. And this includes policies for funding of science, uh, Bill talked about uh, that, about the human resources, the so-called pi pipeline, uh, education, filling the pipeline, organizations that uh, perform science, nurturing those organizations, creating them in some cases, um, communication, publications, travel. Communication is extremely important to science. Scientists have to co communicate. Uh, the, uh, you can't do it in isolation and, and expect to, uh, to achieve anything. Scientific integrity, which is increasingly a problem, keeping people who, uh, out who uh, might cheat, uh, and autonomy, trying to maintain some kind of freedom from political interference in scientific decisions, uh, something that's uh, on the top of uh, a lot of people's minds these days. So policy for science is one, for, one face of, uh, of this. The other face uh, the other is the field of science in policy or science for policy, and that's a much wider field uh, since it includes every policy issue in which scientific knowledge or scientific uh, research is relevant, and that's virtually, virtually everything else. Try to think of a, polit uh, of a policy area uh, that a social or political or uh, uh, issue or, or problem and uh, that uh, does not include, in which, in which are sci societal issues in which science does not have a role, and I can't. So basically, uh, science for policy uh, is the, the whole universe. That's not the whole universe, but you know, it's as close as I can get to one slide. Um, uh, 
So in actuality, we're talking about science for uh, climate change, defense, health, energy, and natural resources, international affairs. Uh, Bill talked a lot about uh, co innovation, uh, communications, food and nutrition, uh, even sports, music, art, uh, even politics. They all have they all have scientific content, and science for policy affects them. Um, that's far too much far too much to cover in this talk. So, um, and much of it is way outside my field of uh, of expertise. So I'm going to focus on what I do know, which is policy for science, and I want to look at the bases on which uh, science policy is made and how it has been changing in the past few years. Uh, for the um, uh, past year, I've been writing, writing a paper on this topic, in which I, which I call the uh, search for evidence-based science policy in the US. Let me let me back up for a couple of minutes, um, back about 75 years or so. Science policy, or science and public policy, uh, as it was called in the, when it first emerged as an area of interest in the 1940s, in that period of, of uh, after the Second World War, uh, when we, as uh, as Bill said, did not want to get back in the U.S had a major focus on not getting back after the war was over, not getting back into the depression, which, which uh, dominated this country in the years before the Second World War. Um, but before the war, the government sponsored relatively little science, and so policy for science was not really a major concern. Major concern. Uh, that changed uh, during the Second World War. Science and technology, R&D, played a major role in the Allies' victory, the atomic bomb, radar, the proximity fuse, penicillin, and so on. And with the Cold War heating up in the background after the Second World War ended, um, the nation's uh, political, scientific, and military leaders wanted to make sure that all that, that magic science machine uh, kept churning out all the, the black box that, uh, that Bill mentioned, kept churning out all those good things, both for our defense and for our civilian economy. Um, and it didn't hurt that there was an arms race, a space race, and a race between communism and capitalism to be the dominant philosophy of, of uh, world politics and economics. Not surprisingly, public policies concerned with shaping science and technology and the scientific and technological enterprise and its impacts on society also grew in importance and scope. In general, those policies uh, were formulated through debate and discussion among scientific and political elites, uh, almost exclusive, men, almost exclusively men, uh, who drew mainly on their own experience and their own judgment, and only later did that did the idea gain currency that such policies should be based on, dev on data, evidence, analysis, even research. And I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, much of the debate and discussion, uh, and stop me if you've heard this before, in the uh, early post-war period uh, was shaped by, here we go again, uh, Van Ever Bush, his influence on the uh, post-war science policy was uh, was really quite a, a, enormous. That's the uh, I have an actual copy of Science: The Endless Frontier from that uh, era. I can't remember how I came came by it, um, but uh, that report and the debates and discussions uh, that followed uh, focused mainly on the big questions of policy for the promotion of science and its application in society. Accountability, organization, values, where should scientific research be performed in academia, in government, in national laboratories? To what extent should it be directed toward advancement of knowledge rather than explicit national goals? And overall, how much political autonomy should science be granted? These were the issues of the day 
in the Vandiver, uh, Van Everbush era. Science, the endless frontier, led to a lot of things, including the National Science, the foundation of the National Science Foundation, uh, a small, it's a small agency compared to, say, the Defense Department or Health and Human Services or even transportation, but arguably it's the most important government agency in the formulation of federal science policy. Uh, a few years later in the 1960s, a literature on science policy began to develop. Most of that was in the form of essays, th thoughts and ideas of the science leaders of that era people such as Harvey Brooks of Harvard, um, Alvin Weinberg, the director of Oak Ridge National Laboratory, um, entrepreneur, an entrepreneur within government, um, and occasionally influential non-scientists who were involved in the scientific uh, world, like Don K. Price, a political scientist and dean at the time of what is now the Kennedy School at Harvard, and who was also the president of AAAS for a year and a key figure in the uh, development of science policy as a field. Uh, books by these people, uh, these authors, line the shelves of my own library at home, and although their pages are turning ye yellow with age, uh, at the center, uh, they're still relevant in a lot of ways. And at the center of these writings was the question of how much support should science receive? How much government support should science receive? And it was around this time that these leaders came up with a figure, uh, believe it or not, of 3% of GDP. And you'll find that in some of the, uh, uh, some of the advocacy pieces of that era. Uh, they did that on the basis of very little evidence, by the way. They debated how it should be distributed among institutions and uh, disciplines, and they speculated on how fast it should grow. And uh, you can guess the answer to that was fast. Um, innovation and putting research to work in um, pursuit of economic growth came up in this discussion, in these discussions but it wasn't the kind of concern that it is today. The general line of thinking was uh, that government should nurture basic research and make sure that there was a supply of high quality scientists uh, in that pipeline. And if they did that, good things would come out at the end of that, uh, uh, fr from that uh, magic science machine. The most widely used methodology in uh, science policy analysis in those days was a technique called BOGSAT. Do you all know what BOGSAT is? This is BOGSAT. It's a bunch of guys sitting around a table. <laughs> <laughs> Time-honored technique that's been widely used in all areas of, uh, of policy making and science policy was no exception. Uh, this was science policy in, in those days. Now, some things have changed uh, with the ties being one, um, but it, and, and importantly, it's no longer a bunch of, just a bunch of guys. There is, there is considerably more uh, gender equality in uh, science policy these days when I first, uh, than when I first got to know the field. So it's not just guys. But nevertheless, science policy recommendations are often still made by a bunch of people sitting around a table. Uh, consensus judgment of a committee, uh, a board, or a task force. Uh, however, that's changing too, because there's a growing sentiment for making science policy more scientific, that is, more empirical and more research-based. Uh, now, the idea of making science policy more scientific isn't entirely new. The notion of a, a science of science policy, or a science of science, that has sometimes been called, uh, was imagined and reimagined several times, starting as, starting as far back as the uh, early 1940s. It's something I did not realize until I started on this current project that I've been uh, 
working on for the past few months. Um, Derek DeSola Price, uh, who, is, who was a, a major figure in science policy theory in those days and science and society, he published an article in 1965 called The Scientific Foundations of Science Policy, in which he described how when he was a brand new physics graduate in 1942, he was struck by a remark made by the British physicist and crystallographer Sir Lawrence Bragg. Sir Lawrence's comment uh, stimulated him to recognize that we could think about physics with the same math methods that we use to think about think in physics itself. And I'll read you a quote here. It struck me then that just as economics was a scholarly discipline that provided an overview of all the commerce and finance and distribution of go goods in the world, so one could do the same for science and thereby satisfy the curiosity I was feeling of why science worked the way it did. Let me emphasize that the universal need for a scientific basis for knowledge about science and technology, um, the need is not primarily for a collection of policy statements, however wise, or for the opinions of scientists, however well informed. We need a special body of scientific knowledge which can be the base, a basis for whatsoever policies governments and citizens may request. Uh, Fryce's article, by the way, was based on a lecture that he gave in London at the first annual meeting of the Science and Science of Science Foundation organization, which as far as I can tell, does, no longer exists. The place uh, where one might expect research such as this to be done, of course, is the academic world. And the program to support science policy research and teaching in universities was established by NSF in the late 1960s. There were a number of universities that had started uh, programs along these lines. MIT was one, always a leader in this, in this area. Uh, there were a few others, but it, it, uh, the, uh, the NSF program, which was supposed to provide funds for these um, uh, universities in this area, only lasted a few years before it got reorganized into something else, the story of uh, uh, the typical kind of government program. Later in the 1960s, uh, the U.S. found itself in a period of, uh, st with a stagnant economy uh, together with inflation. This is the, this is the uh, period that, uh, one of the periods that, uh, that uh, Bill uh, Bonvillian mentioned. Now some members of Congress thought they got the idea that science and technology might help to stimulate growth and break this economic log jam. And, Oddly, one of the major science policy uh, initiatives of that era came out of the fail failure of a large-scale government program that was created to subsidize no less the creation of a supersonic transport agent, aircraft known as the SST. It's an interesting uh, little sidelight to the uh, development of science policy. The SST was, uh, develop, was being developed, was proposed uh, in the 1960s to compete with the British-French collaboration that was building the Concorde. Some of you may have heard of the Concorde. The SST program ended up being killed by Congress in 1971 when its costs grew way over budget another familiar story in government programs, uh, and environmental and citizens groups marshaled opposition to it because of uh, concerns about noise, pollution of the stratosphere, and, and other problems. And the, that cancellation forced Boeing and other contractors, its subcontractors, to uh, uh, lay off about 7,000 people. Uh, it's a major blow to the economy of, uh, especially of Southern uh, California. The, the Nixon administration was concerned about this, uh, mainly for uh, reasons having to do with the upcoming election in 1972. 
Uh, and the White House came up with the idea of creating a multi-billion dollar uh, program called the New Technology Opportunities Program to put these people to work. Uh, many of them engineers, by the way. Uh, and it was a nice idea, uh, but it never got past uh, OMB. Uh, they took a look at the budget for this and said, you're going to be spending $11 billion to do what? And um, that kind of uh, killed the whole thing. But as sort of a consolation prize, OMB came up with this uh, program um, that it gave to the National Science Foundation and the, what was then the National Bureau of Standards, which is today NIST. Uh, they gave them a small amount of money, about two orders of magnitude, smaller than the uh, New Technology Opportunities Program, and to, to create programs and do analysis on the contributions of uh, science and technology to the economy. Um, NSF, in turn, set up what became the National R&D Assessment Program, which eventually turned into the Division of Policy Research and Analysis and um, uh, became a major source of funding for academic science policy researchers, including, by the way, some of the economists that were mentioned in Bill Von, Von Villian's talk. Now, PRA, uh, as it was called, um, conducted and supported some very useful work, but it got itself into uh, hot water uh, with Congress when it uh, uh, conducted a study and bandied, about, bandied it about a, a rather poorly designed study that suggested there would be a major shortage, like 600,000, uh, a shortage of um, scientists and engineers in the next decade. Uh, many people saw this, they did this on the basis of an analysis which was subsequently shown to be rather flawed, and many people saw it at the time as being a rather transparent ploy to increase NSF's budget, which did not succeed, by the way. Uh, I'm not going to get into all the details, but the result was that the National Science Foundation's uh, officials were raked over the coals in a congressional hearing. And the hearing um, killed its taste for policy research for about 20 years. And what finally got, uh, so there was a kind of a drought in funding for academic science policy research over that period. And those of us who were um, uh, researchers in that area um, felt the, uh, uh, the shortage of, of money. It was a very, uh, it was a, a difficult period because NSF had been a primary source of support for the academic science policy community. What finally got NSF and the academic science policy community back into the business was a speech by uh, George W. Bush's science advisor, uh, Jack Marburger. Marburger, um, Talked, uh, gave a talk at the uh, AAAS Science and Technology Policy Forum, um, which is now something that, that um, uh, Matt Hurahan is responsible for. And uh, he was a very, he was a distinguished physicist, a university president, a science ad administrator, but he had a very little expertise and a very little experience in science policy itself. And he was serving a president who was similarly uninterested, really, not similarly, but who was uninterested, and who had some uh, views on science issues that uh, were not consistent with the mainstream of uh, thought in the scientific community not quite as extreme as the current administration, but nonetheless uh, views that he had to defend and found himself in a difficult position. But he was not, in the science policy field, he was not bound by previous experience and he was willing to question the assumptions he found in science policy reports and analyses. And one of his, uh, one, I, I spoke to one of his key 
staff people. He passed away in 2011, but I spoke to one of his key staff people uh, who told me that he had read the National Academy of Sciences report that was a major big deal in its uh, in the early 2000s, and that report um, it was called "Rising Above the Gathering Storm." Some of you may uh, who in that field uh, may, may uh, remember that, and it, it listed as its highest priority recommendation recruiting 10,000 science and mathematics teachers a year by creating a federal program of college scholarships for STEM teachers. Marburger was struck by the specificity of that recommendation. Um, he asked his staff, how did the academy come up with that particular number? Why 10,000? Why not 7,500 or 15,000? Why not 10,002? Um, was that number based on some analysis or, or formula? Well, it appeared it was based on uh, Logstat. Uh, you know, well, that's the, how, much, how many should we say? Uh, how many teachers do we th really think we need? Anyway, by 2005, with several years of dealing with science policy issues at the national level under his belt, Marburger, um, Marburger's thoughts began to, to crystallize, and he gave that speech to the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Forum uh, that uh, in April of 2005, in which he compared science policy to econom econometrics expressing frustration at the lack of tools and models that he and others needed to support decisions of science, uh, of policy for science. Marburger said, it's, and it's, I'm quoting, it's well to keep in mind how primitive the framework is that we use to evaluate policies and assess strength in science and technology. It's the, in the absence of models that link inputs like federal R&D investments to outputs like gross domestic, domestic product per capita, we collect annual data and fit straight lines to it to forecast future conditions. I mean, he was showing a, a, a clear case of economics envy uh, and, and sounding uh, somewhat like uh, Derek Price sounded in that 1965 speech to the Science of Science Foundation. And he went on to speak of the need for a new interdisciplinary field of quantitative science policy studies. And, you know, when a science advisor comes up with something like that, it's likely to happen. Uh, and uh, Marburger got his wish. Uh, and NSF began, NSF then began work on a science of science and innovation policy program called SciSIP some of you may have heard of. Uh, within a few months after that speech, it got, the program got up and running in, uh, in record time, issued a call for proposals, and funded its first grant in fiscal to 2007. The program is now about 10 years old, and during the past decade, NSF, had, the SciSIP program has held 22 competitions, uh, and it has awarded nearly 350 grants, maybe more by this time, for a total of over $70 million. As far as I know, uh, this is the most federal money that has been poured into academic science policy research, well, ever. Um, as of uh, fiscal 2017, uh, the annual budget for the program was approximately $11 million, $11 million a year. Now, there's no telling what it's likely to be in the future, given the current uh, environment in, in Washington. Um, but it's brought a lot of new people into the field, and it's, it's, um, it's funded establish, established um, scholars as well, but it's done a lot of really interesting things. It's, it's spun off uh, programs that apply a whole range of innovative uh, methods to science policy questions. 
uh, including examining um, science uh, interactions among scientists uh, with uh, visual visualization and mapping techniques. SciSIP funded researchers are trying to determine why women represent a majority of applicants to medical school, half of law school applicants, but only a tenth of uh, recent engineering degrees. Um, and they're doing this by bringing together disparate data sets, big data as we like to call it these days, uh, including the effects of starting careers in science and engineering on marriage and divorce rates and the impacts of career interruption on earnings in various fields. Interesting study, I have not seen the results yet, but I'm sure they will receive a lot of attention when they come out. Uh, SciSIP funded researchers are running computer simulations on the effects of different ways of performing peer review on grant proposals, on scholarly publications, and on academic promotion decisions. Uh, they're applying new methods uh, of uh, data mining and information extraction uh, uh, to uh, develop search, uh, specialized search engines for the literature in different scientific specialties. Uh, and in one study, study that I find particularly interesting, researchers are looking at the effects of ethnic diversity in research collaborations on the citation, citation rates of pa papers and funding that papers authored by more diverse teams uh, get published in better journals and have higher impact factors. That's a fascinating finding. And I'm uh, um, taken together these projects um, suggest a growing community of researchers applying advanced social science and computational techniques to science policy programs. And it's an important thing, uh, important step towards the kind of thing that Marburger was talking about. And, other, uh, and uh, it's really bringing uh, science to science policy. Um, I am um, approaching the allotted time for this, and I want to leave some time for your, uh, your questions and perhaps my answers, too. Uh, and so let me stop here and uh, with just by asking the question of whether this is creating all of this ferment is creating a sci an actual science of science policy. Um, well, if you think of science as a coherent discipline with a th theoretical framework, um, no, I don't think it is. Uh, but I what I believe the developments uh, of the past decade are doing is changing the face of what we call science policy, bringing more rigor and systematic thinking into the field. And what there will be, uh, and what we're already beginning to see is, uh, more, is a means of answering questions about investing in research um, and measuring its impacts on uh, the um, economy and on society uh, in a much more evidence-based way rather than an opinion-based way. So there'll always be a place in science policy um, for BOGSAT. Um, but uh, their judgment, the judgment of those people sitting around a table, is going to be informed much more by facts rather than opinions. And in that sense, uh, I think we will have, indeed, a more scientific science policy. So thank you for your attention. Uh, happy to take any questions you might have. down there.
least in any, in, in any meaningful way. And what I said about it dying out was that particular science of science foundation that was set up in, in the UK in the, um, in the 1960s. And uh, I was familiar with it. Um, maybe even gone to one of their meetings, so I'm not really sure. I knew the people involved, or some of them anyway, but I do not, uh, I couldn't find any trace of it in the current, uh, any, cur any recent uh, trace of it. Uh, what has happened is it has been rediscovered, basically, and created within this government program that uh, Marburger had um, uh, kind of advocated, and uh, that, um, uh, and uh, it, in, in doing that, I think it's brought back in a much more, today we have much techniques that are um, much more useful than those that were available in the 1960s, uh, methodologies and techniques. And so those, um, you know, the, uh, those things that I, that I mentioned, the big data techniques, the uh, uh, what they call web scraping and a whole, even just the advent of the internet and the amount of data that's available to people at a, uh, you know, on your laptop at home uh, is, is incredible compared to what it uh, used to be. So the, the availability of all that information today makes science policy research uh, a much more interesting and perhaps valuable enterprise. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm not really trying to evaluate the various techniques. I'm, at the moment, I'm trying to chronicle them and to see what uh, what has happened. But uh, I think we will. What we will see is a uh, is a group of people who are more. Uh, uh, and and I'm afraid I'm not I'm not one of them who are more. Um, uh, educated in uh, these modern data analyses techniques, applying their skills to science policy questions. And uh, those people will bring a degree of rigor to the analysis of, uh, of these science policy issues that uh, uh, hasn't been present in the past. So, um, I mean, I, I Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it hasn't happened. Yeah. And you know, if it if if it happens, it will happen in places like OSTP. Uh, and uh, but um, uh, I don't I don't think it's happened yet. I don't think there's enough. It hasn't it hasn't crystallized to that extent yet. Uh, sir. Is there, I'm sorry. Well, both. I mean, you know, public values is is the ultimate uh, 
the ultimate measure, but but uh, with you measuring the impacts within the scientific community sort of comes first and subsequently, then you have to see what the impacts are in, in terms of public value, and people are doing that. Uh, people at, uh, at Arizona State, for example, are very much advanced in that, uh, in that area, and, and Georgia Tech as well. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, being, that's certainly being considered, and ultimately the benefits to society, uh, social value, or however you want to call it, uh, will be the measure of, uh, of success of all of this business I have it because I mean what why uh, uh, wh what uh, purpose is there in advancing science if you don't if, if it doesn't serve society I mean I'm, I've been you know I was at, at uh, AAAS for 30 years and our um, Watchword was uh, uh, advancing science, serving society. That was uh, that was what AAA said it was doing, and uh, that's what I hope science does. Uh, anybody else? No. Oh. 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 Oh.